thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so I'm Glyph. There are all of the uh, identifiers that you can find me on the internet with. Um, I, uh, I work at Rackspace on open source research, uh, including maintaining my main claim to fame, which is Twisted, uh, an event-driven networking system for Python. Uh, and today, I am here to talk to you about how to ship software to users with Python. Is everybody feeling pretty good? Pretty excited about Python? PyCon? Yeah. All right. Well, don't worry. If you are feeling good, I am definitely going to fix that with uh, this topic, which you can see from the alternate title, Distutils, A Tragedy in Three Acts. So what am I going to tell you in this talk? Uh, the fact that my Distutils joke got a laugh, and I put that in the speaker notes so I knew it was a certainty, uh, is an important hint. Uh, people feel like getting Python software installed is really difficult, and they want to know how to do it. I want to communicate two important things here. First of all, uh, it's mostly just confusing, not difficult, to get soft software shipped with Python, if you know how. Um, and please, for the love of all that is good, do not rewrite your entire application in Go because you couldn't figure out distutils. Uh, do not rewrite your entire Python application in Go just because you saw one weird error message when you were trying to make an exe for your Windows users. Uh, however, the second thing I want to get across is that while the problems aren't insurmountable, there are problems. Um, we should aspire to do much better as a community, and we can do a lot better without much work. So who's we if we have work to do? Uh, there are three audiences for this talk, and I'm going to ask each of you to do some stuff. The first audience, which is the position that I most often find myself in, is library developers. For the purposes of this talk, library developers are people who make stuff and upload it to PyPI. I'm going to ask you to build some wheels for all the platforms you support and put them on PyPI, and I'm going to tell you why you should. And I'm going to be honest, this crowd has it the easiest right now. The tooling in this part of the ecosystem has improved tremendously in recent years. The second audience, which is probably the biggest audience, is application developers. Uh, application developers are people with some code in Python that they want to either run in production themselves or ship to Python developers for them to run as part uh, of their tool chain. What I'm going to ask of you is that you stop making your users care about Python. Uh, I'll tell you why you should want to do that, uh, how you can do that today, and what general conceptual knowledge you can use to do it better in the future. Uh, assuming that our third audience listens to me. But before I move on to that audience, broadly speaking, there are two types of application developers. There are service developers who write code that runs on computers that they themselves control. Uh, given the current Python ecosystem, the majority of us are service developers at this point. The second type is, of course, client application developers who write code that runs on computers owned and controlled by end users. Although I'm going to talk a lot about server-side tooling, because that's what's the most mature at this point, one thing I'm hoping to convince you of is that more of us should become client-side developers, since there's some pretty cool stuff going on there, and it's very nearly within our reach. The third audience is distribution tool developers. I'm not talking about the people who make PIP and PyPI. Uh, I know Donald. Uh, if I want him to do something, I just ask on IRC. I don't have to like do a 45-minute Python presentation. Um, I'm talking about the authors of tools that distribute for client-side applications, mostly. Uh, distribution tool developers are the people who make the tools that convert the code that application developers and library developers write into artifacts that can be installed on the user's platform, whether that platform is servers or mobile or whatever. Uh, let's also define some terms. In an operating system like Debian or Red Hat, a package is a collection of files with a name and a version. Uh, in an archive that get installed together that can be installed with a tool that comes with the operating system. Packages can also refer to other packages, depend on them, recommend them, and so on. In Python, though, uh, just to get us off to a really good start in getting our applications over to users, the word package is differently defined and refers to the collection of files within a namespace. Uh, in Python, the kind of thing that you would call a package in an operating system is called a distribution, uh, specifically a distutils distribution. Uh, I'm, this distinction in terminology is important because uh, knowing what you need to do with packages versus knowing what you need to do with distributions becomes very important when you're using certain t types of packaging tools. Uh, and of course, for maximum clarity, the institution set up to deal with distributions in Python is called the Python Packaging Authority. 
So to a programmer, a distutils distribution looks like a directory containing a bunch of Python code next to a setup.py, which describes that code and adds metadata to it like name and version. I am not going to explain how to write a setup.py in this talk, uh, partially because we don't really have enough time for a full tutorial on all of the different ways that setup.py can be composed, but also because this is the sort of thing you can learn just by reading the packaging documentation. To someone preparing to distribute some Python code, though, either users or other programmers, a distutils distribution may come in lots of other forms, including the, uh, most especially a wheel, which is an archive that contains the code in a nearly ready-to-use form. Uh, and I say nearly, and that's important. Uh, distributions can be described with a requirement, which gives a name and optionally a version. A requirement which typically goes in a requirements.txt looks like this. This requirement says, I need twisted uh, exactly version 16.1.1. This is not a true, of course. You need any version of twisted. But uh, that's how you would describe it that way. So let me begin our story now in a dream. What I'm going to tell you here is how things should be. Let me set the scene for you. A 10-year-old programmer is seated at a laptop typing away at their kitchen table. They're making a little game for their friends. Of course, just like you do when you want to do this, they pop open pip.app. They decide what environment they want to work in. They click the New Environment button because they're going to be working on a new project. They make a game in that environment. They create a new distribution. They specify the version number. They go write some Python code, which we all know how to do, so I'm going to skip that part in the interest of time. And finally, they export their Python distribution as an application. Of course, their friends might not have the same kind of computer that they do, so they can export their application as many different types of script. Of course, you're all probably wondering where you can get this miraculous tool. Uh, it's just an idea that doesn't exist anywhere. It's a dream. Uh, but this is where we want to be. Seamless publishing of applications to multiple platforms from a simple user interface that you can understand. In this act, I've just described my wish for a tool that could solve all these problems for us and shown what it might look like. But now let us descend into the desert of the real. As I said when I was defining my audience earlier, the most popular way to ship a Python application today is to deploy it on a Unix-like application, or sorry, a Unix-like server of some kind. So what I'm going to tell you now is the right way to produce artifacts for deployment in the cloud. Once again, I'm not going to tell you how to write the code for the cloud. You've got Flask and Django and Twisted and whatever, so you can take care of that part. Uh, once you've written some Python code and you've put it in a distribution by writing a setup.py, now it's time to get the distribution installed somewhere. So where do you install a distribution? Uh, when you install any Python code, you install it into a Python environment. A Python environment is a collection of file system locations where you can put files that will later be found by an import statement in some Python code that's being executed in that environment. The default Python environment is sort of the intersection of a few different things. Uh, the system standard library directory, the system site packages directory, the user packages directory, and directories on the Python path environment variable. In the bad old days, Python path as an environment variable was used uh, quite extensively to glom together multiple code locations. Uh, but in the modern Python ecosystem, that is thankfully no longer necessary. In fact, it's usually considered quite a bad idea, so don't do that. You shouldn't be deploying Python code with Python path. And speaking of things from the bad old days, you should never install code into the system Python environment. Either for <laughs> Did not see that coming, but awesome. I'm glad that message is getting out there. Uh, so apparently for many of you, this will be old hat. But any Python code installed into your operating system is going to expect your operating system versions of code. This means that if you ever sudo pip install a package, you've potentially broken your entire operating system. Your OS vendor has hopefully, although not really, done integration testing across all of the packages that they ship. Uh, but when you start making import mylib do something arbitrarily different, you are now responsible for testing every single tool in slash user slash bin that might ever import mylib. In addition, if you start writing stuff into system Python directories, you are creating files, but those files don't have matching database entries in your system package manager's database. So not only have you create a created a Frankenstein package environment in the import namespace for Python, you've also potentially broken the ability to upgrade and ruined any checks that the operating system has in place for uh, integrity. So once again, 
Never install anything with uh, sudo pip install. Never tell users that they should use sudo pip install uh, because you're potentially overwriting files from your platform with a tool that doesn't know how your platform is managed. Another thing you should avoid doing is invoking setup.py install directly without going through pip. If you do use setup.py install, it won't make a record of what files it created. It won't necessarily import setup tools uh, because pip forces setup tools to be loaded before it loads your setup.py, even if it just imports distutils. That means your version information may be inaccurate or absent. It might not be in the right format. So uh, there's no, also no such thing as setup.py uninstall. And if you install with setup.py, pip won't know what files you've installed, so it can't uninstall them. One way you can create your own Python environment that, uh, is that you can compile your own version of Python from scratch. Uh, this might be, seem extreme, but in many cases, it actually makes sense. Um, if you build your own Python, you can bundle up that whole directory and be fairly sure that it'll work, but only relatively sure. Uh, your build of Python might accidentally depend on stuff from the operating system, and you would need to discover which things those are. The other problem with building your own Python environment is that it might be a little heavyweight. A Python build is approximately 100 megabytes of overhead if you include all of the stuff that gets generated and is included in the source. Uh, in our modern era of terabyte hard drives, this isn't prohibitive for a final artifact, but for development, where you might be working on two or three different projects, each of which might be using a dozen or so tools, that's more than a gigabyte of overhead, not to mention the expense of, uh, in time of compiling an entire Python VM anytime you want to change anything. So this brings up a popular tool for addressing this problem, virtualenv. Uh, one of the reasons I started off with a uh, long description of what a Python environment is, is virtualenv is one of the worst named projects out there. Nobody gets out of bed their first day of learning how to use Python and says, I need a virtual env. Uh, virtual env creates lightweight Python environments uh, by sharing most of the common bits, most of that 100 megabytes, uh, with your system's Python installation. So this offers a 90% reduction in size. A single virtual env has the overhead of about 10 megabytes, which means you can have 10 times as many. Perhaps more significantly, it takes only about a second rather than minutes to produce a new virtual env, so it's something you can easily do over and over again while you're debugging. So is virtual env what you should use to distribute software to all your end users? Sadly, no. Uh, virtual env achieves these optimizations by creating an incomplete environment, uh, which points it at and shares resources with your main Python environment. So you can't move a virtual env between computers without moving the entire main Python environment at the same time, which can be extremely tricky. But this is a qualified no. There are cases where virtual env is a totally reasonable solution, as long as you build the virtual env on the target machine where the software is being deployed. Uh, if your user is a server that you need to ship code to for deployment, uh, you're, then your deployment target isn't really the target OS. It's a target Python environment on that server. Uh, you have to prepare that server by ensuring it has a Python environment ready. Uh, once you've done that, you can make sure that virtual env is part of that root environment, uh, ideally by using system package tools. Uh, although, as a last resort, you could just use pip to install virtual env into root's home directory, if that's what it comes to. Um, then you need to create and populate a virtual env for your application on that server. This can be done very fast and reliably, starting with a requirements.txt. If you use the same requirements.txt in build and production, you can have a high degree of confidence that the environment on the server will look very much like the one you used in development. And you can create the environment on your build, uh, you can create all the resources you need to construct the environment on your build server, then construct the environment itself uh, on the deployment server with virtual env and populate it with pip. Once you've done that, though, a requirements.txt file isn't quite enough for one major reason. It's fine to have C code as part of your project, but when you're done building your code and it's time to install it, you really don't want to have a C compiler on the server. Having a C compiler on your server is bad because it means you get potentially different compiled bits in each deployment. <laughs> Couple Russian speakers, I guess, in the audience. So there's a, there's a principle in statistics and systems theory. This is a real thing. It's called the Anna Karenina principle. Uh, in Tolstoy's book from which the pr principle takes, it names, he, ah, takes its name, he formulates it as, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. This is also true of servers. Every happy server is the same, but every unhappy server is unhappy in its own way. 
If you think about administering a server in production, have you ever had a pleasant surprise when you found something unusual? <laughs> this is what that surprise looks like. Uh, <laughs> these differences can make, uh, that between different build environments on different servers can make debugging really difficult. Uh, furthermore, this kind of issue, when it crops up, it's cropping up in C, and now you're a C developer and not a Python developer, and this is not CCon. Uh, if you need to invoke a C compiler on your server, it also slows down deployments, sometimes dramatically. Although running compiles on all of your servers at the same time does parallelize, it means that you add a fixed amount of latency to your entire build pipeline. Uh, there's also the fact that development tooling can considerably increase the size of each virtual machine or container. The basic set of Debian packages you need to compile almost any C module on a Debian-derived system such as Ubuntu, Python dev, libffi dev, dev, libssl dev, takes up about 180 megabytes of install space and requires twice that to unpack and get installed in the first place. This means you need half a gigabyte of space just to get ready to install your application before the first part of it is even installed. That's a lot of overhead, even more so in the container-oriented world, world we are moving towards, where each image uh, for a small service is expected to cram into a few tens of megabytes, already a tall order for the 100 megabyte Python interpreter. I hope I've made the case that you don't want to build toolchain uh, in your production servers. This means that you don't really want to sh ship source packages to your production machines for installing. Uh, even if some, some of those source packages only include pure Python code, the fact remains that the format of random source archive could always contain extension modules, and it's better not to take that chance. And if it helps you to remember this, just remember that when you see a tool for building in the right place, it just looks like a tool. But when you see a tool for building in the wrong place, it raises ominous questions like, <laughs> why is that there? Before we get around to what you should do, there's another thing that you shouldn't do in production, which is to do any network I.O. You should be able to push your code into production uh, as a whole unit without having to worry that your production machines are then going to need to go back out to the internet to retrieve more information. Why don't you want your install process to do network I.O.? Well, the main reason is reliability. You want to ensure that your deploys are all or nothing. Of course, building software is complicated. It might fail. Networks are flaky, and copying the code to the production mean machines might fail in the first place. But once everything's made it all the way there, you don't want any special checks and retries or halfway states between it's deployed and it's not deployed. Uh, if one of your dependencies goes missing due to a temporary network outage, you don't want your service to be unable to start up again until that retry finally succeeds. Uh, you also want to be able to restrict your networks as much as possible. Uh, if you've got two internal services that are part of an application which should only be able to talk to each other, uh, you should be able to cut off their network access entirely once the packages are transferred to those machines. Uh, not everything needs to be hardened quite this much, but then again, not many applications really have a need to talk to PyPI at runtime. Uh, so this should be the sort of thing you can leave up to your network administrator. There's also the question of availability. Now, PyPI hardly ever goes down these days. In fact, even to take the screenshot, I had to just make a fake 404 because uh, there's nowhere that the PyPI is down from. But your network connectivity to PyPI is probably less reliable than the service itself, and you should be able to complete your deploys even if you have a routing problem. So when you build your application, which should be a distutils distribution, and all the libraries that it depends on, each of which should be a distutils distribution, you want to build each one into something that contains your Python code and any compiled extension modules in such a form that it's going to put the files into place and not do anything dynamic in installation time. Does the Python packaging ecosystem have such a thing? Why, yes, it does. Wheels. Wheel, a wheel is the representation of a single Python distribution uh, which can be installed on a platform or set of platforms. It includes, in its name, metadata about which platforms it's suitable for. Uh, when I say platform here, I'm describing a general concept, which can be either a Python version, which can be two, three, or both, uh, a specific runtime, C Python, PyPy, or either, uh, a set of operating systems, uh, OS X, Linux, or Windows, uh, and so on. Now, when PIP is uh, presented with a repository containing multiple wheels that represent the same distribution, uh, it can figure out which one it needs based on that metadata and get it installed for you. So if you're a library developer, making wheels and uploading them shouldn't be too hard. Mostly, you just need to run this exact code. Uh, this creates a single wheel for your library for the platform that you are running this build on, and then uploads it to PyPI. However, 
There's no way to make this asterisk big enough. Uh, it's not quite that easy or everyone would have done it already. Uh, but if you're a library developer, please do this for all major platforms, Windows, Mac, and many Linux One. Uh, since you probably already know how to deal with any C libraries you're developing as a library developer, uh, your users don't. I don't have time to cover all the nuances of that process, uh, so you'll have to stay for Paul Kerr's talk right after this one. It's really kind of a non-optional extension of the same topic. Uh, but I will say that you have two choices. Uh, either you deal with the subtle nuances of any C code you're using, or you force every single developer who uses your library, and then probably most of those developers' users as well, uh, to deal with those problems. If you're a service application developer, uh, it's even easier, assuming that the library developers have done their jobs and built wheels for you and uploaded them to PyPI. Uh, if not, you'll want to stay for Paul's talk, too. You need to have a requirements.txt which describes the exact versions of everything that your application needs. Uh, if you are security conscious, you should also put hashes of all of those things into your uh, requirements.txt. And you can go back and watch Ying Li's talk from uh, yesterday to see how to do that with some pretty cool signing technology from Docker. Um, so once you've got that, though, you just need to run this. Uh, you need to run uh, pip wheel with your requirements.txt, and it will output your built wheels into a directory of your choosing. Uh, the best part for application developers is that the more of your dependency vendors have uploaded binary wheels, the less work this step is. If everybody's done their job, then this just downloads a bunch of wheels and compiles your one thing. Uh, I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise for the listener as to how to best get these wheels from your build host to your production host. There are a number of different ways. Uh, that's at least two or three different talks in its own right. Uh, but once you've done so, all you need to do is create an environment, tell pip to install only the wheels you just built, uh, make a virtual env and run uh, pip to install the wheels into it. So this here shows a zero downtime blue-green deploy that's uh, hopefully you've got a load balancer in front of it. But uh, this is how you make a new virtual env, install stuff into it, and then blow away the old one. To recap the workflow, I'll tell you what I just told you again, uh, in order to get a Python service into production, what we need to do is describe the service as a distributals distribution, saying what code it contains, and a requirements.txt that carefully describes what each version of its dependencies it's going to use, build the software and all of its dependencies into wheels for our target platform, and finally ship the software to the production system where we install the software into a virtual env with pip. I don't want to talk too much about containerization in this talk, but at this point, it's important to correct a common misconception. Um, and this misconception was reflected in a talk just yesterday, so apparently it's still out there. Docker is great. You should definitely use it. But many people in their exuberance hear about Docker and assume that this workflow I just described no longer applies to them. Uh, it's a container. It's isolated. Root can't break the operating system. Just ship images everywhere. Uh, sudo pip install everything. You don't need virtual env. You don't need wheels. Everything can just run in one big container. Containers do improve this situation somewhat, and there's less that you can break. They certainly make it harder to make mistakes. But fundamentally, the same general rules hold because, fundamentally, the thing you're running in the container is a Linux distribution. Instead of you don't want to have build tools installed on your production host, it's you don't want to have build tools installed in your service containers. Uh, and instead of you don't want to use sudo pip to break your operating system, it's you don't want to use sudo pip to break your base image. This last point bears repeating, I think. Debian and Red Hat are fantastically complex engineering projects integrating billions of lines of C code. For example, you can just apt install libav codec or yum install ffmpeg. Writing a working build system for one of those things is a PhD thesis. They integrate thousands of Python packages simultaneously into one working environment. They don't always tell you whether their tools use Python or not. Um, and so, you, you might want to docker exec some tools inside a container. They might be written in Python. If you've sudo pip installed your application in there, now it's all broken. You can't use any of those tools. Um, so even in containers, isolate your application code from the system's Python tooling, uh, or build all of your containers using from scratch without the benefit of apt or yum. And if you do the latter, that may help you appreciate all of that stuff I just said about being hard. So far, the story is pretty good. We can build software repeatedly, we can ship it to production, and we can assemble it uh, into a working system on the deployment host without any build tools except for pip. 
However, you'll notice that I've been talking almost exclusively about server-side developers. Uh, so uh, in this section, hopefully, I've uh, covered all the best practices for server-side deployment. As we turn our eye to shipping Python software to end users, though, this is where things begin to fall apart. In this segment, I'm going to tell you about the sometimes rocky road to deploying end user, to, uh, deploying to end user devices in Python. The problem begins with the caveat I gave at the end of the last section, except for pip, because pip itself is a tool written in Python, which means that if you just upload your software to PyPI for end users, you have to tell your users to get a working Python and a working pip before they can install anything. Most, many projects tell their end users to pip install various things, so this is a common anti-pattern. Don't do that. Let's assume that getting a working Python on your system is trivial. Uh, it's already there on OS X. Uh, it's on, on Windows. Let's pretend that every user can instantly intuit the difference between Python 2 and 3, download the right thing, figure out how to start up cmd.exe, or maybe install git bash. Let's also install that pip is just installed correctly. If you just pip install, uh, after having done that, you will get a permission denied error because you aren't root. It's going to try to write to a directory owned by root. If you have the option to sudo pip install, which you might not, congratulations, you just broke your operating system like I just spent many minutes describing. There is an issue in pip to fix this, uh, ticket 1668. It was opened in March of 2014, has over 100 comments on it, a half a dozen open dependencies, and it shows no sign of being fixed anytime soon. But even if that issue were fixed, or you somehow in advance can convince users to do pip install dash dash user uh, to, put their, uh, to put your application into their home directory, uh, and your application, and we're still assuming here that your application is like a nerdy command line thing, is generally documented uh, as a command line like awesome app. And pip install dash dash user will put the script in a place that isn't available on their command line by default. In order to fix that problem, now we have to, to tell the user to learn how to configure their shell. We all like Python. We like Python because we get to write code in Python. Writing code in Python is fun. But users do not like Python. Users don't like Python because users, by definition, are not writing code in Python. They're just trying to run our code that's written in Python. But instead of our code actually running on their systems, their phones, their uh, desktops, their servers, uh, instead, if they try to just follow the instructions they find on the web that say sudo pip install everything, they're going to run into error after error. So for us, Python is a language that lets us do amazing and fun things, but for our users, it is a hollow, imperious voice telling that their system has been judged and found wanting. <laughs> it is telling them that they are unworthy to run the software that they think is so cool because they do not have the all-important vcvarsall.bat. So now that I've dug this hole for us, it's time to claw our way out of it. Think for a second about how you get software when you actually want to accomplish a task other than programming in Python. You might download it from an app store, or you might go to somebody's website and double-click an installer, or you might use a package manager like apt, dnf, or brew. Uh, and as a brief aside here, uh, I'd like to just talk about the Go build tool chain. Go has a great build tool chain. It produces a single file executable. That's great, and it's a much simpler jumping off point for what we're trying to get to here than what Python offers us, but it's not the full story. The problem is that one file isn't enough. Every app store and package manager requires an archive of many files to install, usually mandating at least a few pieces of metadata. Uh, if you want your software to be automatically updated, if you want it to have a GUI, if you want it to generally be a thing that you would use, you don't get most of your software by just curling some random URL, chmod A plus X, and then you're uh, you know, good to go. You, you get it out of these systems that have multiple pieces of metadata. So there have been a lot of efforts to prioritize single file executables coming out of Python. And while those efforts are cool and people should work on them by all means, uh, we don't need to do that. And we shouldn't really prioritize it in the, the service of getting an easier deployment workflow. We should target these stores, these package managers, these operating systems, as our deployment targets, because that's where these executables are going to go anyway. So before we get into more self-contained options, for your nerdier users, you might want to consider the benefits of integrating with system package managers. After all, if Brew install is good enough for you, maybe it's good enough for your users who are like you. Um, obviously, this is not a great way to get started on a mass market application. 
Uh, but homebrew can automate ensuring that you have uh, the other pieces in place that you need for your uh, application to work. So to get started on this, if you want to build something that can be brew installed, you can take a look at the Docker Compose formula, which is already available in Homebrew, uh, and is a pretty straightforward of, uh, collection of Python packages that are all already hosted on PyPI. And it takes something which is sort of like a requirements.txt and converts it into a usable command line tool. Uh, it's kind of odd in that it uses a combination of a launcher shell script and Python path to achieve partial isolation from your system Python, but it is a really straightforward example which gets the job done. Uh, however, there's still no simple automated way to get from I have a Python tool available in the distrutils distribution to I have a pull request to open in Homebrew, so that's something that an enterprising distribution developer could work on. Uh, but there are tools that go from a Python source distribution to an operating system package. One tool from Spotify can convert a Python package into a virtual env that is created as part of a Debian package. This is the best of both worlds. You can participate in Debian's package database, which in the class of sort of client Python distribution, uh, if a desktop Debian user is using your thing, you need to install desktop files and other bits of operating system metadata. Uh, yet you can still isolate your dependencies so they don't conflict with Debian's Python environment. There's also one built into Python called bdist rpm, which con converts your distribution into a Red Hat package. Much as with Homebrew, however, neither of these give us a place to upload RPMs or Debian packages so that users can simply uh, apt install or DNF install. Uh, one gap that could really easy, easily be filled here would be to have Twine or a tool like it start to automate the part where you create a package archive for users to actually get the package installed from. But enough with nerds. We're mostly muddling, muddling along OK with our Python installations anyway. So what about regular people? Let's say you've gone to the trouble to write a GUI application. How do you get that to people? There are a number of tools that can start with a Python script and produce a usable application for users. However, you will notice that I said script and not distribution. Starting again with OS X, a pretty good tool for creating redistributable applications is pi to app Starting with a standard setup.py, uh, you add a special app keyword argument to setup, and then you run python setup.py pi to app. You need to specify a main point for your application to run, since double clicking can only do one thing. Uh, but you can also specify any info.plist values that you want, so you can set an icon, as well as interact with any OS X platform APIs that require interacting, uh, metadata to interact with. It does basically the right thing with shared libraries. You can include frameworks for native dependencies. Um, and uh, it can bundle in a Python interpreter or optionally use the system one if you want a really lightweight executable. pi to app builds what is effectively a self-contained Python environment that is an application by itself. I'm not going to include a full walkthrough of the docs here, but in many ways you're in good shape out of the box. pi to exe and pi installer are tools that can do pretty much the same thing on Windows. Uh, it has a similar mechanism where you put a few extra annotations in your setup.py. Uh, or there's a cross-platform version, CX Freeze, which may be more to your taste since it requires only one specification of metadata. In many ways, you're in good shape now with these tools. However, in one key way, you're not. This is really the inspiration for this talk. I've talked a lot about overhead and optimization so far, but one almost universal problem shared between almost every tool for end-user distribution is that it attempts to optimize too much. One of the things we all love about Python is its dynamism. You can make all kinds of dynamic decisions at runtime about what to do or not to do, how objects behave, and whether or not to import modules. This is one of the reasons we have setup.py to describe what modules to include in a distribution. Just because a .py file is present in a Git repo doesn't mean it's something we actually want to import, and Python could do basically anything at runtime. So we describe what modules we make up a package to instruct it what to install as a way of making a promise about how we expect a particular installed package to behave. Uh, however, there's this module inside uh, that's a dependency of pi to app and a few other things, module graph. And what module graph and its cousins in pi to exe and CX freeze do is to parse the main script that you provide, statically read all the import statements in that file, then all of the import statements in the files identified by those imports and so on, so that it can create a stripped-down executable. This is useful functionality to have eventually because you often do care about overhead when distributing to end users. But before you care about that performance, you really want to care about a working thing. And by eliminating imports that are not done statically, various pieces of built-in Python functionality break horribly when you try to use them. 
namespace packages, for example, which you may be depending upon without realizing it, because the limited static import analyzer doesn't know how to parse them, just won't import. If you pip install any packages with a dot in their name, like zope.interface or fluffle.enum, you're probably using those. Uh, this is another broken by default scenario, like the pip's insistence on installing into the operating system by default, even though it knows that that's going to fail if it, uh, by default, and a bad idea, even if it works. Um, a small change to default here could be a huge improvement to usability. But things aren't all that bad. In particular, if you hit an issue with one of these tools where it doesn't include a module that you expect it to, once again, don't rewrite your whole application in Go. It's only going to take you five more minutes. It's not an 18-month re-engineering project. Uh, so it's easier to work around these packaging tools than to rewrite all of your application code. One workaround which fairly universally works across all of these different tools is to just take every possible import that your application might be doing anywhere and statically include it in your initial file. Every one of these tools takes a main script as input uh, because, again, you're building a single executable. It can only do one thing when it starts up. So the debugging cycle for working through all of these packaging tools is build the binary, run it, watch something like this happen. Then once you've got an import error that says what module couldn't be imported, you go back to your main script, and then you add the import statement. Do that 30 or 40 times, and you will generally get a working executable. Now, it's really unfortunate that we have to do this, but it's, in the grand scheme of things, not that much work. Of course, who could forget everyone's favorite client environment, the browser? Uh, and there are several mostly working runtime environments for Python in the browser. Uh, I was hoping to have a whole section of this talk dedicated to them, but exactly zero of them have any mechanism for distributing anything to end users at all. You just have to kind of build a script yourself to somehow glom them together. So all I can say here is, good luck. <laughs> there are, however, some trends in the right direction. Uh, people who are starting to adopt the right design principles around this problem. Uh, the PyB project in particular I'd like to call out uh, because they've been doing a bunch of work in the area of generating redistributable applications for a variety of platforms. Now, they've done work in the area of uh, graphical user interfaces and other types of tools to help with this process, which are out of the scope of this talk of actually doing the build. Um, like foreign function interfaces. But the specific library I'd like to call your attention to is Briefcase, which implements the conversion of a, of a setup tool's distribution into several different formats. And you pretty much just do this to produce OS X, iOS, and Android applications out of whatever code you happen to have in your project. There's one major limitation to this, which is PyPI does not support wheels for iOS or Android because most of us Python developers aren't there yet. Um, this is something I hope to talk about in a future year, uh, but if there are any enterprising mobile developers out there, this would make a huge impact if you could get this working. Uh, another tool that I'd like to mention uh, is PyInsist, which is Thomas Clover's Python wrapper around the Windows install program NSIS. Uh, and that can convert your Python code into kind of a traditional uh, wizard-based Windows installer. Uh, it's also moving in the right direction here. Thanks to some of the discussions that we had in preparation for this talk, in fact, uh, Thomas had the idea to make PyInsist work by downloading collections of wheels from PyPI, and those collections of wheels now include things like Piglet and PyCute, um, Py which allow you to build graphical applications out of the box, no compiler or anything that just install seamlessly onto Windows. So there are definitely some rays of hope. And I may have painted a somewhat bleak picture earlier when describing everything as broken by default, but many people manage to do interesting things with Python and distribute them to end users all the time. Uh, this here is a screenshot of MC Edit, which is an editor for Minecraft written in Python that millions of users use successfully without knowing Python had anything to do with it. Uh, there are Mac and Windows versions. Um, so this is all eminently possible with today's tooling, and it's worth trying it. Uh, in closing, I'd like to issue a call to action. We should have tools that target each platform. Uh, I could ask you to write that tool, but of course, that's a lot of work. However, the hard part of writing that tool is almost always done. Each of the tools that I've referenced today are amazing technological feats of mastery. Uh, they do things like rewriting executable files in place to point at the correct shared libraries. Uh, they automate multi-platform builds. They sign and secure software. In many, uh, uh, most of the shortcomings in the build tool chain have to do with really simple bugs, like not 
taking those amazing files they just constructed and putting them in the right place or trying to optimize them too aggressively and skipping something that they needed to do. So these tools don't need massive technical innovation. They just need basic fixes. The situation in browser-side Python is a testament to this general symptomatic, or systematic problem. Multiple teams have written entire implementations of the Python language, transpilers, interpreters, automated test suites, even a just-in-time compiler that compiles C code into JavaScript code and then has C code in there that emits dynamic JavaScript code to JIT your Python code into the browser's JIT. PyPy.js actually does that. But the thing that's missing is a script that you run over a zip file full of Python code to like run the same command over it a few times. That's, that is the missing piece. So if the world of packaging feels intimidating, just remember that it's all about putting the right files in the right place at the right time. And if you're savvy enough to be watching this talk uh, or the video of it later, chances are you're savvy enough to have moved a file or two in your day. So you can fix this. Finally, if I missed it, I apologize for not covering your favorite packaging tool that's one uh, epsilon closer to the desirable goal here. Um, there's already a lot of stuff in this talk. The ecosystem is already bursting at the seams. So uh, go forth and package. All right, we have a few minutes for questions, so I'll come around. Just a quick correction, the Pi installer is cross, across platforms, not only Windows, it runs on Mac and Linux also. Thank you for the correction. If we should never ever use the pip that's shipped by Debian, then why does Debian ship pip? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> So we were having an internal discussion at our company about vendoring PIP requirements for, um, you know, for our production machines so that we know we always have a, a, like a solid, repeatable um, PIP environment for our production packages. Please give me a reason to go back to them and say, no, we definitely don't want to do that. I'm sorry. Uh, can't Please you? give me a reason to not do that. Uh, yeah, vendoring is kind of an odd thing that people do. Like, you, you should be making a mirror of the upstream packages and building them. But vendoring by like changing all of their names in the Python import hierarchy just makes it harder to do security updates. There's no real benefit to doing it that I'm aware of. Um, PIP does it, for example, because of some very specific kind of bootstrap requirements for being the tool that you use to get other stuff installed. But unless you're writing PIP, you probably don't need to do it. Good. Hey, so wheels are awesome. All the binary packages are awesome, but please also still recommend people ship a source tarball to the Python package index because there are a lot of platforms that that's the only way the packagers on that platform can build the binary for it. Sorry, yes, I should have mentioned that. You should absolutely upload your source alongside any wheels that you support, and you should build all of your wheels by building that source. You shouldn't make a bunch of source tarballs that you never look at and then build straight out of your Git repo. It's important that there be correspondence between those two things. Um, as, as sort of a halfway between um, like packaging a complete EXE in the example um, desired program that you put up at the beginning, uh, do, you, do you feel like uh, uh, shipping a requirements file and a virtual env inside a Docker container is a pretty good halfway point? Or what else would you like to see with that to make that pretty viable? So I think that shipping Docker images, uh, like on Docker Hub or something, that are virtual ems inside a, a container, that's a great way to go. That is a complete deployment artifact for a platform. That platform is Docker, so you have to, you're targeting Docker users if you're doing that. We do need to target other platforms, but that's totally a valid way to go. So I have an answer for my own question. The Debian package maintainers for Python are in the room, and they don't want to identify themselves for fear of being <laughs> assaulted. But the Debian pip that's shipped with the operating systems installs the user by default. Since when? That, I, wow, that's awesome. Thank, thank you. Yes. Uh, on that happy note, that concludes Q&A. Thank you. Yes, thank you again, Glyph. 
So yeah, thank you, and thank you for everybody who asked questions. Obviously, this ecosystem moves fast, so don't trust anything I just said. Go read the docs and stay up to date.